Hey guys, welcome back. Today I'm gonna to show you the eight most essential power tools that you need to get if you wanna get started in woodworking or just have some backyard DIY projects to finish. So stick around. I'm not gonna list these tools in any particular order, but without a doubt, the first tool you need to get is a drill. That's not a drill, this is a drill. I'll explain in a minute. If you're gonna be doing a lot of assembly, then a cordless drill especially is gonna be a bit of a no-brainer. You're gonna use this tool more than just about any other tool in your arsenal. There are a few things that I wanna go over with you before you just go picking out any drill off the shelf, willy-nilly buying it and wasting your money. This is a drill chuck. Say hi, Chuck. The drill chuck has teeth that grab whatever the drill bit or driver bit you're using and hold it in place. Make sure you buy a drill that has a half inch chuck, not a 3 8 inch chuck, or you'll regret it later because you'll be severely limited in what bits you can use. Let's talk about voltage. You'll have to decide whether you want 12 volt, 18 volt, or even 20 volt. But for the purposes of this video, we'll just stick with 12 and 18. You're gonna want an 18 volt tool if you plan on doing a lot of heavy duty work. Maybe you're working with concrete a lot. Maybe you're drilling all day. Generally, professionals are gonna want 18 volt, although not always. If you're gonna be working on projects in your backyard or around the house or just in your small shop, probably a 12 volt will work fine for you. 12 volts have come a long way in the last couple years. Generally, I'm not a fanboy of any particular brand of tool. There's lots of good brands and I've used pretty much all of them over decades. But I must say, I must say, these 12 volt Milwaukee fuel tools are pretty amazing. I have drilled holes in metal with these. I have drilled holes through oak, big holes. And these things just, I mean, they just keep going and going. And again, I'm not sponsored by Milwaukee. Everybody makes good tools. This is just what I have at this moment. And I think they are amazing. Something else I would recommend if you're only gonna get one drill is to make sure you get a hammer drill. It'll give you that extra function that if you ever have to drill into concrete, you have it. You may never need it, but it's good to have it. Since I did mention brands, I will suggest this. Pick one brand that you like, do your research, find out one that fits within your budget and does what you need it to do so that you don't end up kind of like this where I've got all these different chargers, charging different size batteries and different brand batteries. Here's a tool you don't need, but you're gonna want. This is the cousin, if you will, to the drill, and it's an impact driver. Let me just get this filthy star drive out of there and put a proper square drive in there. I did a whole video on the differences between a drill and an impact driver and a hammer drill, so you should go check that video out. But essentially what a impact driver does in a nutshell is at the point where when you're driving a screw that a drill would start to lose power where it starts to hit resistance, that is when the impact driver gets increased power, sort of. It's got a hammer and an anvil in there essentially and it spins around and a lot of times people will hear somebody using an impact driver and they think they're stripping the screw out because it makes that sound, but that's actually the hammer hitting the anvil and it's actually driving the screw even better and more effectively than a drill will. You don't use an impact driver to drill holes, it is for driving screws. Although, it also works great with these socket adapters. As I said, the impact driver, not an essential tool, but very handy. And a lot of times when you go to buy a drill, you'll find that you'll see drill and impact drivers sold as a combo set, and you can save a ton of money by doing that. A lot of times you can almost get the impact driver free. So be on the lookout for sales like that, and you'll have both tools. Another tool you're gonna wanna have is a random orbit sander. Random orbit sanders are great because they minimize the sanding marks that are left when you finish sanding whatever it is you're building. The effectiveness of the sander can vary greatly depending on which model you use. And generally, a lot of times, the more expensive the sander, the better it is at removing sanding marks. But I tend to stick with the basic ones like Makita, DeWalt, Bosch. I also go with the five inch pad and make sure you go with hook and loop and not peel and stick. These orbital sanders will have a port at the back where you can hook a vacuum up to it, or most of the time they come with a bag 
Again, when it comes to the sandpaper, you want to go with hook and loop, not peel and stick. And like these are solid sanding pads, but you can also get the pads that have the holes in them. And like this has a variable hole pattern, but that way, whenever you've got your vacuum hooked up, it'll help suck the dust through these holes. Let's talk about jigsaws, baby. I can tell you right off the bat, this is gonna be the tool that's the most aggravating to use. And it's the tool that most woodworkers, carpenters, DIYers hate the most, just because it's got a lot of quirks. And because honestly, nobody makes a very good one. I shouldn't say that, that's not necessarily true. There probably are some good jigsaws. They're just really expensive. This jigsaw right here, I've had for probably 20 years, this DeWalt one, and I've hated it every day I've ever used it because a couple things. See how I've got this blue tape on here? You know, blue tape is supposed to stick for three days. This has been on here for probably no less than five years because the way that this is made, oh, focus camera, you can do it. See that slot right there? There's a fan in there that blows dust directly up into your face when you're using it. So I put that piece of tape on there to keep the dust from blowing in my face. Oh, they have come a long way though in 20 years. Just a few weeks ago, I got this new Milwaukee M12 cordless jigsaw. And let me talk about some of the differences between jigsaws real quick. This, as you can see, has the handle on the top. Ergo, vis-a-vis, -vis, this one is called a top handle jigsaw. This one is called a barrel handle or a barrel grip jigsaw because you notice that the handle is down lower and it's behind it instead of on top of it. It's kind of, I don't know, is it, is it further behind? I don't know. I digress. It's a barrel grip. Ooh, pinkies up. Keep it fancy, people. The blade rides on these guide wheels to help keep it straight, but what happens down here? Well, it can't control that. You just got to go slow and controlled to try to maintain a nice cut. If you ever want to make a curved cut, you're going to need a jigsaw. But a jigsaw can be handy for other things as well. Right now, I happen to have ta -da, a hacksaw blade in the jigsaw, which can be very handy when cutting metal instead of using a traditional hacksaw. There are lots of different types of blades that you can get for a jigsaw. There's fine finish. There is general purpose. There are scroll saw blades for doing really tight turns. Generally, a jigsaw cut's coming up, not going down. But you can also get these reverse cut so that if you are cutting on the surface of the wood and you want any tear out to be on the back, you can use one of these blades. Whatever jigsaw you decide to go with, do make sure that it accepts these T-shank quick release bits. In the last three to five years, I'd say, the availability of cordless versions of traditionally corded tools has grown drastically. A corded jigsaw will suit you just fine and get everything done that you need to get done. But I would highly recommend, if you can, to go with a cordless one. Oftentimes when you're using a jigsaw, you're gonna be moving a lot, especially if you're cutting out something large that's round or curvy. And what happens is the cord gets in your way a lot and gets snagged and hung up and you find yourself constantly reaching back to adjust the cord. So if you can swing it, I would definitely go with a cordless jigsaw. Time to break out my classic circa 2001 Ryobi circular saw. Up until last year, this was my primary circular saw that I used and it worked great. It's kind of funny looking at it now though, uh, the colors on it, especially with this yellow saw blade, that this thing just looks like a toy with the, the blue body. You know, these are the old Ryobi. I say Ryobi, I understand it's Ryobi, but I don't care, I've always said Ryobi, so I, I can't make myself change. It just looks like this is like a kid's toy or something, but it's not, it's very dangerous. In fact, the circular saw is probably the most dangerous tool you'll use. Circular saws are sometimes called skill saws, and that's kind of like just a generic term, but skill saw is a brand, and it's because skill saw invented the portable circular saw, so it just kind of became like the standard name for them. But they come in a variety of sizes, seven and a quarter, six and three quarter, on down smaller, where they're just basically cut off saws and larger, you know, giant size beam saws. If you're only gonna get one, I would recommend the seven and a quarter size. However, 
I'm thinking about switching to a cordless one. And if I go cordless, I'll probably go with six and three quarter just because I already have the seven and a quarter size. The most common use for a circular saw is dimensioning rough lumber. And that's what makes it so dangerous. Generally, you're gonna be on the left-hand side of a circular saw. But sometimes you may have to, for whatever reason, be on the right side of it. And sometimes people will put their hand up underneath here to support this piece that's gonna drop and they don't pay attention and they just run that saw right into their hand. So do be careful and pay attention to your digits whenever you're using a circular saw. I loaned this circular saw to a friend of mine about 10 years ago and when he brought it back, this is how it looked. He actually cut the cord with the saw and brought it back with just electrical tape. Personally, had I borrowed somebody's circular saw and cut through the cord, I probably would have bought him a new circular saw. However, for him, that was good enough, and apparently for the saw, it was good enough because it's worked just fine ever since then. A variation of the circular saw is the track saw. And what is a track saw? It's a circular saw that, you guessed it, rides on a track. A track saw is definitely not one of the first woodworking or DIY or backyard tools that you will need. The only reason I'm showing you this is because last year I upgraded from my circular saw that I've had for 20 years to this Festool. And the only reason I went with Festool is because this one has a larger blade. This is the TS-75. It has a approximately eight and a quarter inch blade so I can cut really thick lumber and I can also use it as a kind of a joiner because I can run the track all the way down the piece of lumber and put a straight edge on it. So that's why I got this saw. There's a lot of track saw manufacturers and Makita, DeWalt, you know, all the, all the regular companies and they're all fantastic saws. They all work really well. For a track, you can also just use a piece of plywood that has been cut into a strip or a two by four. I used this for 20 years before I bought this, so you definitely don't need a track saw. Circular saws and track saws, I'm just gonna lump them in here together, but primarily I'm talking about circular saws, are great for not just dimensioning lumber, but for when you've got to cut something out, like whenever I did my workbench here, I needed to cut the top out for my router table section and for the downdraft sanding section. And I used the track saw for that, but you could do the exact same thing with a circular saw. They're also good for notching out lumber when you need to, if you need to chisel out a section for mortising or half laps or whatever, you can cut through with the circular saw, take a chisel and finish it up. So there's another use for them. On the lower end of the need scale is a router. And especially what I would recommend is a trim router. Routers, like most other tools, are gonna to come in varying sizes and amounts of horsepower, usually one to three horsepower. This is a one horsepower Bosch Colt, and I've probably had this maybe 10 years, and the reason I recommend a trim router over a full-size router, at least to start off with, is because these things can do an amazing amount of work for the size that they are. I have used this for far more than it was intended to, and projects that really, I was pushing the limits as far as the horsepower that this has, and it has held up amazingly well. Now at some point, very soon, I'm gonna upgrade to a cordless router, just for the convenience, because just like with a jigsaw, the cord ends up snagging on everything when you're trying to route around something, and you find yourself constantly adjusting or, or it, stopping you and you can't figure out what it is and you realize the cord is hung up on something. So the new cordless ones are really awesome. They're a lot more expensive though because you have to buy the tool. A lot of times the, the tool may not even come with the battery. You're best to try to get them in a combo if you can, but far more expensive than the corded one, but the corded one will work just fine for you. Routers use different bits to allow you to put different edges on whatever project you're working on. You can have a round over or a cove, a chamfered, edge or you know a 45 if you're not familiar with chamfered and a flush trim bit this is one of the main things that i use it for drills use a chuck to hold the, the bit in place routers use what is called a collet and it kind of works in the same way 
It's a two piece. This is the top piece. This is a quarter inch collet. It accepts quarter inch bits, but it goes down on a second piece that's attached to the router. And as you tighten it down, it squeezes these pieces right here around the, the bit. Routers also work great with a jig because you can basically use it as a compass for cutting circles out like I did on the barbecue cart to hold the grill. At some point you may want a plunge router. My plunge router is under a pile of junk in my shed because that's how little I used it. But basically it does exactly what it sounds like. It allows you to plunge the router down on slides that are built into the base so that you can drop it down, pick it up, move it, drop it down, pick it up. Or if you need to just drop it down in something and move along a jig, you can also do that. But you know, in the last 20 years, I've probably used a plunge router four or five times. That's just for my needs. What you do may be different. Depending on which model you get, probably your second biggest investment in tools is going to be for a miter saw, sometimes called a chop saw. On the scale of necessity, I would say that this one ranks pretty high, but you could do a lot of the things that you would typically do on a miter saw with a circular saw. It's just, it's a lot easier on the miter saw. The miter saw gives you repeatability because if you've got it on a fence, you can set up stop blocks. It lets you miter, it lets you bevel depending on which model you get. Look at the different models and decide what works best for you. I would say this is a 12 inch blade on this miter saw. Do not go less than 10 inches because you'll find that you're just really limited in a lot of things that you'll find yourself wanting to use it for. If you can get it, if you want to spend the money and you have the room for it, I would definitely go with a 12 inch miter saw. Now, whether you want the dual compound or compound or whatever, that's up to you, but I would definitely go with sliding. Don't go with just a stationary miter saw. The table saw is going to be your most expensive investment as far as tools go, almost no doubt about it. Table saws are going to vary in size and horsepower depending on which model you get. I have the job site size table saw, which is going to be the smallest, and it has one and a half horsepower. From there, you'll work up to the contractor size, then a hybrid, and then the cabinet saw. And the hybrid is the blend of the contractor and the cabinet saw, with the cabinet saw being the biggest and heaviest, and typically those have three to five horsepower. Although most table saws use a 10 inch blade, some do use smaller ones, but definitely stick with a 10 inch size blade. That's going to work out best for most things you're going to want to use it for. There's a few things you need to keep in mind whenever you're trying to determine which type of table saw is best for you, whether it's the job site on up to the cabinet saw. First is space. I'm very limited because my shop is my garage and no matter how much I clean it out and intend to use it for my shop, the garage part keeps taking over and more bicycles and four wheelers for the girls and stuff tend to fill up and take up the space where my tools would normally go. So I had to have a job site saw so that I could move everything out into the driveway to do all of my cutting. But if you have room, if you have room for a cabinet saw, get the cabinet saw. Again, it depends on your budget, not just how much room you have, but on the scale of budget and space availability, go with the biggest, most powerful saw you can afford. If you decide to go with a job site saw, really pay attention to its mobile base that comes with the saw. Not all saws come with them, but if the one you're getting does, definitely look at that. This base on this saw stop is amazing. I love this. It's so easy to set up and move around. Table saws can be really versatile because of the ability to use different jigs on them. Uh, you can use cross cut sleds. You can use uh, tapering jigs. You can use jigs for cutting out doors, mortise and tenon cuts. There's all kinds of jigs that you can get for table saws that will let you do far more than just cross cutting and ripping sheet goods or rough lumber on your table saw. 